help me thank Lindsay and our John Young campus team and, and our own for work, leading us in worship. Amen. You know, one of the uh, many privileges, and there are many, of being one church with two locations. And so, for some of you that may not know, uh, Horizon West Church is a campus of First Baptist Orlando, which is located at John Young Parkway. And so, uh, we refer to that campus as our John Young campus, and this is our Horizon West campus. And so, the opportunity to share resources and to, uh, to share energy and just the vision and the mission that God has given our, our church, First Baptist Orlando, just a neat thing and, and cool to see a tangible expression of that this morning. So once again, just help me thank Lindsay and, and Ryan and those guys for leading us. Uh, before we jump in, and if you want to turn to the book of James, again, we're continuing in our series uh, in, in James chapter 1. Um, I've had several people mention to me this morning, as we're even remembering those in Pittsburgh and, and, and the city there, uh, several people have mentioned to me of what's going on in Brazil right now. I know kind of round two of the elections are there, and there's a lot of uh, maybe anxiety is a good word to, to, to put there about uh, that election and what could come as a result of that. And so um, I'm going to pray. I'm going to ask the Lord to tune our hearts to his word, but I also just want to remember uh, those in Brazil and those who are here from Brazil uh, who just have a little anxiety this morning. Um, and we can understand that um, in, in a world that's, that's just kind of crazy right now, but we want to lift them up and pray. Um, and then we're going to ask the Lord to speak to us through his word. So would you join me in prayer as we turn to the word? Father, we do just want to remember uh, our, our brothers and sisters in Brazil and those who are here from Brazil. Um, God, the, the anxiety that they feel about a very tumultuous time uh, in the life of their nation. And God, we just pray that the outcome of the elections today would be um, exactly what you have in mind. God, we know that no authorities are placed except what you have uh, decided beforehand should happen. And so, um, God, we trust you. We, we trust your sovereignty. Uh, we pray that regardless of outcome, Lord, we pray the believers in, in Brazil would be able to, to point to Jesus and say that our hope is not in a, a man or a woman uh, here on the earth, but it's in Christ. And God, that you would even use a tumultuous time in that nation's history uh, to, to point to Christ and to bring people to yourself. God, as we turn to your word, we pray very simply that you would speak to us, that we would hear from you. Um, and God, we would go out these doors and we would do what you've called us to do as a result. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So James chapter 1, I invite you to turn there with me. Uh, we're going to tackle about eight verses today. We begin at verse 19. And let me read James chapter 1 and verse 19. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Where we're going to go today is, is James is going to give us the, the recipe or the key to a blessed life. And, and it is not accumulation of wealth. It is not uh, 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 doing a bunch of rituals that somehow please God. He's going to give us the key to blessed life, and you might be surprised at what it is, but it begins with an alert that James says right in the text in verse 19. He says, know this. What's interesting is it does not follow with something that we are to know, but something we are to do. In other words, he's not giving us factual information. He's not saying know a statement of faith. It's basically like he's saying, hey, listen up or pay attention. Tune your ears in. And then James gives us a series of imperatives. He says, be Three things, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Does that just sound refreshing? Does that just sound like the kind of person you want to be? My grandmother is one of my favorite people on planet Earth, Grandma Ida. And she is actually one of those rare people who is a great, great, great grandmother, if you can believe it. Um, she's in her 90s. She is an avid baseball fan, uh, Detroit Tigers fan particularly, but loves the game of baseball. And one thing that's interesting about my grandma Ida, she is the best listener that I know. The best listener that I know. Which means that even though, despite her age, she always has people around her at family gatherings because everybody loves to be around somebody who listens to them. So the, the kids love to be around grandma Ida. The adults love to be about, around grandma Ida. She, she asks questions. She listens. She, she's not somebody who's quick to speak and offer her opinion. She just loves to hear what God is doing in the lives of her children, her grandchildren, her great grandchildren. You know, I would have a hunch that the people you most enjoy being around are people who are quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And on the flip side of that, probably the people that bug you, that rub you the wrong way, the people that you don't enjoy being around are people who are slow to listen and quick to speak and quick to become angry, right? 
And James says, listen, as you're following Jesus, as you're trying to live a life that he's going to bless, one of the things you need to know is you need to be slow to, uh, quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. It's an old saying that God gave us one mouth and two ears for a reason, right? We should listen twice as much as we speak. Anybody have a parent or teacher that told them that when they were younger? Well, this may be for you then. See, this is such an important thing in our relationship with God, not just with other people, but it's an important thing in our relationship with God. Because, see, I think we have a tendency when we come even into a time of prayer or a time of worship, we just jump right in and we got our laundry list of things. Okay, God, here's all the things that I need from you. And what if we were quicker to listen and slower to speak? Did you know that, that the spiritual disciplines, things that Christians have practiced for thousands of years now, almost all of them are tied to the idea of being quick to listen and slow to speak. Disciplines like study, solitude, silence of itself, of course, prayer, fasting, meditation, it all points to the idea of somebody who's, who's slowed down their life enough to tune their ears into what God has to say to them. Because speed kills, right? When I was 18 years old, I, I was not the world's best driver. I'm still not the world's best driver. But when I was 18 years old, I one time in a six-month span got four speeding tickets. I, I almost lost my license. I had to go to driving school to get the points off, and I sat at 11 points out of 12 for like a year and a half, and it was terrifying. <laughs> I drove like a little old lady for about two years. Um, but at driving school, they taught me something. They said, you know what? Something like 70% of accidents would be avoided if people would just slow down on the roads. See, we're all so quick to get places. We're in such a hurry. And the same thing is true in our lives that's true on the highways. We're just, we're just so fast. We're just running to and fro, and we're just constantly going, and we're just erupting with whatever's in our mind. And, and we see the result of this on our social media feeds and all these things where people are just dumping everything they've got. And the word for us from James, the, the word for us from Scripture this morning is slow down. Wait. Get quiet. Get still. Because it's in times of stillness that, that we can hear from the Lord and that we can live the life that he's called us to live. This, this phrase, slow to anger, actually appears four times in the book of Proverbs. In fact, some people refer to James as kind of the Proverbs of the New Testament. He, he says all these things that are, that are rooted in wisdom and kind of these little statements. And, and they all go back to this idea that, that really was in, in the Old Testament, in the book of Proverbs. But that, that term, slow to anger, especially is a common one there. Uh, one verse that I want to share with you, Proverbs 16, 32, says this. And this is, I think, what James is building on. He says, Whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit better than he who takes a city. See, we live in a world that prizes strength, that values strength, and strength is the person that goes out and takes what they want. Strength is the person who dominates the conversation. Strength is the person who controls the narrative. But James says, and Proverbs say, and Scripture affirms throughout, that strength is best displayed when it's under control. See, without restraint, strength is actually weakness. And we all know people, or we know of people, who boast of their strength. They think they can go out and do anything, but they can't control their own tongue or their own spirit. Those are not strong people. Like a river that's flowing outside of its borders, it becomes dangerous when it's not within the channels that God has called us to live within. I would just invite you to think about a time that you acted in anger. And what was the result? Was it joy? Was it peace? Was it reconciliation of people? Or was it the opposite? See, I know when I, when I speak in anger, when I'm quick to, to anger, when I have that short fuse, typically somebody gets hurt. Usually it's the people closest to me. I'll, I'll never forget one time, uh, my, my oldest daughter, Addison, just has a sensitive spirit, and uh, she was on the iPad one time, and I, she had not asked permission. It just was, I was having a, a rough day, and I was a little frustrated, and she's on the iPad, and she, she likes to vlog, I think it's called. <laughs> we don't actually allow her to put anything out into the you know, world, but she takes videos of herself as if people are watching her. It's a weird thing, but she probably sees other people do it. So she'll go, hey guys, so I'm just here doing, and she'll do these long, you know, videos that I find. So there's one particular day, I'm, I'm frustrated and, it's a, you know, trying to do things or whatever, and I come out and I see Addie on the iPad vlogging, and I say, I just get on to her, I'm like, Addie, what are you doing? You did not ask permission. And she turns to me, and keep in mind, she's videoing herself, so she turns to me with this look of just like, 
her spirit is just broken, you know, just, just completely crushed. So I went back and I just happened to be watching the video that she made and I saw the face that she made when I spoke out of anger to her and I captured it. I took a picture of the video and I saved it to my phone because I wanted to remember what it looks like in the face of my then five-year-old daughter when I'm quick to anger. And it hurts. And it's likely that that many of us can remember a word spoken in anger by a parent, by a teacher, by a friend, even when we were so young. And now we're, you know, sometimes in the same position where we're then speaking in anger toward other people and we're, we're just doing this without thinking. But James says, listen, slow down long enough to think about what you're doing. Think about what you're saying. Typically, anger is not gonna get you where you want to go. He says it like this, the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Now, there are people that like to think that they have righteous anger, but can I tell you, there, there's a way to know if your anger is righteous or reckless. Righteous anger usually is aroused in defense of someone else. <clears throat> in other words, it usually gets angry when someone else is being wronged or taken advantage of. Holly, can I get some water? Reckless anger is almost always aroused in defense of myself. So it's when I don't get my way, when I feel like I'm getting taken advantage of, then my anger can become reckless. Righteous anger is usually a response to injustice. See, it's right to get angry about things like human trafficking or or racial inequalities or abortion. That's right. And righteous anger is usually a response to some kind of injustice. But reckless anger is almost a, a response, almost always a response to personal preferences being violated. Man, they just didn't get my order right. Or, or my, my team lost. Things that, that I want, it didn't go the way that I wanted. I remember one day talking to a friend and I was, I was angry about something and I felt like I had a right to be angry and he kept pressing it with me. Why are you angry? And I kept saying, he kept saying, why are you angry? Why are you angry? And finally I said, dude, I'm angry because I didn't get my way. And he said, there it is. And I would just encourage you to say, when you're angry, why, why are you angry? Do you have a right to be angry? Is there a legitimate reason to be angry? See, reckless anger almost always is a response to personal preferences being violated. Violated. Uh, righteous anger is often kindled slowly and grows over time. Think about what anger has produced. Uh, I have the feeling that uh, people like Martin Luther King Jr. or Mahatma Gandhi, they were motivated by righteous anger, and it grew over time, and it, they couldn't shake it. It was motivated for other people. It was, it was driven by changing the world, and, and it was used in incredible ways. But, but reckless anger is very different. Reckless anger tends to ignite quickly and erupt and just go off. Righteous anger leads to positive action. Reckless anger leads to negative outbursts. And so we ask ourselves, why are we angry? Because here's the truth. Our anger reveals what matters most to us. Think about that. Our anger reveals what matters most to us. If I'm angry that the server didn't get my order right, but I'm not angry at the fact that millions of unborn children are killed or that children are being trafficked all over the world or that people of a different ethnicity or skin color than mine don't have the same opportunities I have, if those things don't make me angry, then my anger is misplaced and it shows that I value me. I value my preferences, my desires, more than those of other people. So remember, God is trying to produce something in your life. James chapter 1, verse 3 tells us that. He says, uh, James 1, 3, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. See, you remember that from, from earlier in the series. God is trying to produce something with us. He's trying to produce righteousness in us. And James says, Your trials that come on you, if you allow them to, if you stay under them, they can produce steadfastness in your life, which leads to righteousness. But anger, verse 20, will never produce the righteousness of God in your life. So what is the cure for the reckless heart? Read again, James 1 and verse 21. So therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. That word, implanted word, James does something interesting in the book of James. He he constantly talks about the gospel, but he uses different phrases. And I think here is one place where he's referring to the gospel. That implanted word is simply the gospel. Because it's the implanted word that can save your souls. And what can save our souls but the gospel of Jesus Christ? See, the gospel, James says, is like a seed that gets planted in our hearts. And if we'll allow it to, it's going to grow and it's going to produce something. But when we let anger, when we let being quick to speak and slow to listen, we let these things into our lives, it's like choking out the seeds that God has planted in us, the seeds of the gospel that he wants to produce through us. When I was younger, 
Um, I was in the middle of, of seven children, and my mom one day got the idea that she wanted us to plant a garden. I don't know why she had the idea, but we, we set to work in the side yard, and we started you know, planting this garden. And we get like 70% of the area done, and we come up against a root. And it was like a gigantic root. And so we're getting our you know, shovels or whatever, and we have no idea what we're doing. And we're just hacking away at the thing. And I think somebody had a hatchet trying to get it. The thing wouldn't budge. We could not get it out. The root went so, so deep. Guess what we ended up doing? We gave up. <laughs> no garden, right? We just gave up because the root was so deep, we could not cultivate a garden around it in such a way that would produce something good or healthy. And the truth in our lives is that sometimes we let roots of bitterness or anger or things in our lives that, that grow into the garden of our souls and the implanted word of the gospel can't bear the fruit that it's meant to produce because of those roots. And so James says, get rid of it. Get rid of the filthiness. Get rid of the moral corruption. Allow the gospel to produce in you what God has put it there to produce. So one reason you may be stunted in your spiritual growth may simply be that you're not heeding the words of, of James to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. But there may be another reason. Look, look again at verse 22 through 25. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he looks like. But the one who looks intently into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. In chapter 1, James is going to give us two ways that we can be deceived. The first is this. We can be deceived when we pursue things that are not of God. Remember last week we talked about Eve and how she was convinced that the fruit was good, and so she took it. And James says, don't be deceived. Every good and, uh, and perfect gift, everything that you need is coming down from the Father. So don't be deceived by pursuing what is not from God. But here he's going to give us a second way we can be deceived. The other way we can be deceived is when we don't pursue what is from God. In other words, when we think that by hearing truth or even believing truth, we're good. And see, everything in the New Testament, all of the letters that are written, they're all written in response to something that's going on. So we have to assume that James is writing to people who think that they can hear the word of God but not act on it. And keep in mind, this is 15 to 20 years after Jesus has been on the earth. So already, just 15 to 20 years after Jesus has been on the earth, Christians are finding a way to not do what Jesus said and make it sound spiritual. You know, that's a trend that has continued to this day. I, I, I hear it, I go to church, I hear the sermons, I read my Bible, I do the rituals. It's not about any of that. All of that is good. It's all good for receiving the implanted word. But James says, don't just receive it. Do something about it. A.W. Tozer, a great theologian of the 20th century, said this, an intelligent observer of our human scene who heard the Sunday morning message and later watched the Sunday afternoon conduct of those who heard it would conclude that he had been examining two distinct and contrary religions. If that's painful to hear, maybe we need to do some self-examination. Does what we hear in the Sunday morning sermon, what we preach in the Sunday morning sermon, what we read in our Bibles in the morning or at night, does it match up and line up with the way that we treat people, the way that we live and the way that we love? Because if it doesn't, we're not scoring any points. We don't get to check the box when we hear the sermon or read the Bible. There, I did my spiritual duty for the day. No, don't just be a hearer of the word, but also be a doer. I would say it like this. The sermon isn't complete when I stop talking. It's complete when we all start doing what God has called us to do. See, the responsibility is every bit as much yours as it is mine to be doers of the word. We all have a unique role and responsibility when we gather, but the most important thing happens not when we gather, but when we go out and live according to the word of God as he has given it to us. Again, this lines up with Jesus. Not surprising given that James is his brother. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, said this, and this is well known to many of us who grew up in church. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them, and does them, he will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears the words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. 
And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Wise man, the foolish man. One builds on rock, one builds on sand. You know what's interesting, though? If I'm reading Jesus right here, they knew and heard the same truths. The difference was not in what they knew, it was what they did with what they knew. See, see it is, it's nothing unique or different that we gather on a Sunday morning and do church. What's unique and different is when we go out and live like Jesus is real. And we apply the words that he's taught us in our daily lives. You know, Jesus taught this. He actually took it one step further. We're not going to turn there this morning, but in, in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus speaking says, on the, on the judgment day, at the judgment, God is going to take the people of the earth and he's going to divide them into two camps, the sheep and the goats. And you know the difference between the sheep and the goats? According to Matthew chapter 25, and I don't want to make it all of my theology based on one passage, but we do need to hear this. In Matthew 25, Jesus says, when that separation occurs between sheep and goats, the only difference is that some of those did what God had told them to do, and some of those did not. He says to the sheep, listen, I was hungry and you fed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was in prison and you visited me. And they go, man, when did we do that, Jesus? I never saw you hungry. You were never in prison. And he says, well, whenever you did it for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you were doing it for me. And he turns right around. He says to the, to the goats, he says, and you guys depart from me because I was naked and you didn't clothe me. I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was in prison and you didn't visit me. And they in the same way say, Jesus, we never saw that situation. They're thinking, Jesus, if we'd seen you hungry, we'd, we would have fed you. And Jesus says, when you didn't do it for the least of my brothers, you didn't do it for me. I would encourage you sometime this week, look at Matthew 25. Whoop, spilled some water. <laughs> look at Matthew 25 and see if, that's not what, see if that's not what Jesus is teaching, that it's not those who simply know or believe the right things, but it's those who do the right things who will be blessed. You know, looking around our world, we see churches, some of them are built on great worship experiences. Some are built on great studies of scripture or or Bible teaching. Some are built on great social action. You know, my prayer in my heart for Horizon West Church, all of those things are good. We want to do all of those things really, really well. But my vision for Horizon West Church is that we would be a people who simply hear and do the will of God. Because see, that's when the world's going to wake up and notice. The songs are great, but they don't care that we're singing. Scripture is is powerful and life-changing, but they're not listening to it. They're listening to you. They're watching you. And I believe when Christians go out and live as Christians ought to live in following Jesus, not perfectly, but doing their best to follow after Jesus, God can do something great in our lives and in our communities through that. James says it's like looking in a mirror. When we look at Scripture, it's like looking in a mirror. And he says the person who looks at the scripture and then goes away and doesn't do it, it's like a person who looks at a mirror and then forgets what he looks like. Now, some of you may wish that you could forget what you look like, but that's beside the point. The point is you don't look in a mirror to notice how good you look. You look in a mirror to see what needs changing. See, in the morning when you wake up and you roll out of bed and you go, wow, that hair needs to be done. Or for some of you, maybe I need to put something on my face or I need to shave or whatever. We look in a mirror so we can change the appearance. Did you know it's the same reason we're to look at Scripture? We look at Scripture so we can see, God, where, where is your word uh, directing me and where is my life not lining up there? Where is there incongruency? Where do I need to change? Not bending the Bible to, to look my, like my life, but changing my life to reflect the words of God and the teachings of Jesus. See, that's what we're called to do. I heard Francis Chan one time uh, use the illustration of telling his daughter to clean her room. And he said, now can you imagine, I tell my daughter to clean her room, and then 30 minutes later she comes out. Room isn't clean, but she goes, Dad, I really loved the way you told me to clean my room. It just, it really meant a lot to me. And in fact, it meant so much to me that I memorized exactly how you said it. You said it just like this, go clean your room right now. And not only that, Dad, I've written a song about it. Can I sing my song for you? (laughs) But the room's not clean, right? It's like, no. If you tell your kid to clean the room, you just really want them to clean their room. And and I think we can, you know, we laugh about that, but we can get in a situation where we go, but God, I'm I'm singing these songs for you, and I'm I'm memorizing the, the words that you said. 
That's all great. That is all good. But if you're not doing them, you're missing the mark. You're missing the point. Scripture is not only for our comfort, but also for our correction. See, I think one of the reasons we don't get more out of Scripture is that we're approaching it through the filter. We want to see it. We go, man, what do I feel today? I feel kind of lonely. Let me find a verse that, that shows me I'm not lonely. Okay? And Scripture is great for comforting us, right? But did you know that Scripture, scripture exists for more than that? 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. This is one of the last things that Paul ever said. He's writing to a young pastor, Timothy. He said, all scripture is breathed by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, that's rebuke, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Every good work. See, all scripture is, is breathed by God and it's useful to change us. It's like that mirror that shows us what we look like so that we can change and adjust the way that we need to be. And James says, this is the perfect law. This is the law of liberty. Not, not the Mosaic law. The Mosaic law could show you where you didn't uh, look right. It could show you where you didn't measure up, but it had no power to change you. The gospel has power to change you. The, the word of God, the law of liberty, the New Testament gospel has the power not only to show you your need of God, but to bridge the gap and to make you like him by doing the will of God. Romans chapter 8 talks about this. Again, the Apostle Paul, Romans 8 talking about the weakness of the law, says this, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. In order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. See, I think that's why James calls it the law of liberty. The Mosaic law couldn't set us free. It could only condemn us. But the law of liberty, i.e. the gospel, that's a law that can set us free. Free from our addictions, free from our shame, free from our bondage, free to live and do as God has called us to live and do. See, we know from James that the path to freedom and the blessing of God in our lives is simply this, to first hear what God has to say to us and second, to do it, even in the midst of trials. Remember, the people he's writing to are being persecuted. They're being hunted down. And yet he says, hear and do the will of God in the midst of trials, even in the midst of temptations. And so the way I want to close this morning is I want to give you an opportunity to respond. And, and this is not going to be a come forward, come to the altar kind of moment. If you need somebody to pray with you, we have people in the back who would be glad to do that. Instead, what I want to end with is just the opportunity for you to spend some time listening to what the Lord would be speaking to your heart through the message, through his word, and maybe just writing down something that you're going to do, something you're going to change this week, not, not because you're trying to perform for God. It's not about that. But because in honor of God's word and the sacrifice of Jesus, I believe you want to live a life that's honoring and worthy of him. And so we want you to just to take some time to reflect what is God speaking to you? That's the first question. And then secondly, what are you going to do about it? And I would encourage you to try to think of something very specific. Maybe it's something in your life that needs to change. Maybe it's an opportunity that you know God's put on your heart, but you've been kind of just waiting on it. You've not been acting on it. And today the call is, you've heard, now do. So in just the next few moments, if you would, just write where you're at. Maybe get out a piece of paper, a pen. Maybe write a note in your Bible. What have you heard from God today? What are you going to do about it? Let me pray and then the team will lead us in just a moment. Father, again, we do thank you for your word. Um, God, we would not know uh, what to do, what to believe, where to go, where to turn. God, we say with the Apostle Peter, Lord, you alone have the words of eternal life. And God, we, we don't want to be, the last thing that we want to be is hypocrites who profess one thing with our mouths but live a different way with our lives. So God, help us to be not perfect. God, help us to be authentic. Help us to live with integrity that the things we proclaim, we believe, we all also live and do throughout our week. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Roaring
so much for coming and in this chilly morning and be part of this wonderful worship my name is Carmen I'm one of the leaders here and one thing we wanted to share with you a practical way to do the Word of God if you believe God wants us to live in community 
We have great life groups in this area. We have for single women, married uh, with small children, married with uh, older children, uh, single men. Uh, we have all kinds of groups there. You can live in community. Learn how to do the word together. So we invite you to come to the back and just uh, put your name down and we're going to share with you the information about those groups. And if you're here for the first time, we have a, a gift for you in the back. And we just are so glad that we are able to start our Sunday together. So you are dismissed and thank you for being here this morning. See